by defining the problem and stating a clear promise, you have a much better sense of exactly what your product is expected to do for customers. And this helps us narrow the scope down. Hey, it's Rick Kettner here. Welcome back to the Startup Vlog. This is episode number four. And in this episode, we're gonna talk about how to define product scope. So whether you're building a product or a service or an experience, whatever it might be, the idea here is to get very clear on exactly what it is that you're building and who it is that you are building it for. Now, this is very important for two critical reasons. Number one, Many startups really fail from what's called feature creep or feature bloat or something like that, where they set out with a pretty clear sense of what it is that they're trying to build, but over time, there's this inclination to say yes to more and more features. Maybe as you're going through customer conversations or as you're just thinking about the idea further, you come up with all kinds of interesting possibilities for how you could improve the product idea. And so you add more and more features. And of course, the result here is that the launch date gets pushed out further and further, whether intentionally or just as a result of taking on far too much. So that's kind of the first issue. The second issue is is that it's much more difficult to market a product that doesn't have a clearly defined scope. So as the product kind of tries to be all things to all people, it can be much more difficult to explain what it is that your product does and how it can benefit people in a succinct and clear way. Because as the product kind of starts to do too many different things, there's this temptation to wanna to talk about all the different ways in which it can benefit a customer. And just generally speaking, the more clear and concise and easy it is for the customer to digest what it is that you're providing, the more likely they are to ultimately buy. So again, the two reasons, easier to get your product to launch by having a clear scope and easier to market your product when you have a clear scope. So with that in mind, let's dive into some examples of the kinds of things to think about. Now, just as a quick refresher, when it comes to the startup that I'm building, I'm building a business around helping parents discover how to raise kids to be successful in an unpredictable world. So again, with things like artificial intelligence and autonomy and rapidly changing technology, it can be very difficult or intimidating to try to figure out how to raise kids today to ensure that they have the tools and the abilities and the confidence to be successful over the coming decades in a world that will almost certainly look very different than the one we are in today, where jobs of today won't be here tomorrow, and it's just generally difficult to know what kinds of skills and abilities are important to focus on when raising kids today. So that's kind of what it is that I'm trying to solve. That's the problem I'm trying to solve. Now, the first product I'm creating is a book to kind of outline how to resolve this problem. And as I've hinted at in previous episodes, there's the potential to have follow-up products, whether it's a community or a service or other things to enhance the learning experience and the way in which parents might implement these ideas. But initially, I'm focused on a book. So with that in mind, when it comes to scope, I happen to be following the formula from Write Useful Books by Rob Fitzpatrick. It's a book that talks about all kinds of interesting startup principles, but within the context of creating a book. So I'm going to use the formula from that book, but I'm also going to translate it here for you so that it goes beyond just how it would impact creating a book because odds are you're creating a product or a service or an experience that is not a book. And so I'm going to kind of provide that translation. But the general equation from Write Useful Books by Rob Fitzpatrick is that scope equals promise plus reader profile plus who it's not for plus what it won't cover. So to translate this to have broader application, scope is equal to Promise plus who it's for plus who it's not for plus what it won't do. These are the four things you really want to focus on when you're defining the scope of your product or your service or whatever it is that you happen to be building. Now, number one is the promise that you are making. Now, if you refer back to previous episodes, I talked about how your startup idea is best defined as the problem that you're trying to resolve. So whenever you're thinking of a product that you wanna build, 
You want to define it based on the problem or the need that the customer has that you plan to help resolve. And this applies to virtually any startup idea. So even, for example, as I mentioned, if you're creating an entertainment-based product, you might not typically think that that is solving a problem, but the underlying problem is boredom or loneliness or something like that. The customer has a need and your product happens to resolve that need. Now, the promise is effectively how you plan to resolve that problem. Or put differently, when you're coming up with the promise of your product, it should resolve that problem in a significant way. So that is your goal, and you want to clearly define the promise that you're making to customers. What, what will it look like in your marketing material? How will you explain the value of your product to your customers? You want to get very clear on the promise because ultimately, by clarifying the promise, you know what it is that your product needs to do in order to be successful. In other words, you need you'll understand how it will be measured as to whether or not the product ends up being successful. So by defining the problem and stating a clear promise, you have a much better sense of exactly what your product is expected to do for customers. And this helps us narrow the scope down and understand what it is that we need to focus on rather than getting caught up in other features that may not actually contribute to the promise. Now, next up is identifying the ideal customer of your product. Now we've talked a little bit about this throughout the series and how customer conversations and things like that can help you narrow that focus and get a better sense of the ideal customer for your product. But at this stage, as we're defining the scope, we simply wanna use our best understanding of who is the ideal customer for your product. And one very valuable tip that I will include here comes from Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey A. Moore, and that is when you're defining your ideal audience, one factor that is very much worth considering is the way in which those customers may or may not interact with each other. In other words, the ideal customer is one that is very likely to talk with other ideal customers. You want to identify a group that likely connects in some meaningful way on a regular basis because this, of course, unlocks the possibility for strong word of mouth referral. Because if you ultimately deliver on the promise, well, people are going to want to talk about it and they're going to want to recommend it to other people. And if for one reason or another, you've identified a customer base that does not have regular contact with other people that might benefit from your product, then you're really gonna miss out on this natural benefit. So in an ideal world, you're finding a customer that regularly communicates or engages with other people that might be customers as well, so that they can spread the word and cause other people to come to your business. And one of the key benefits here is every time you spend money on marketing or you put out effort towards marketing, you're not just closing a single sale, you're closing a sale that might lead to future sales. So maybe by paying for advertising to attract one customer, you might end up with them referring three or four and those people referring three or four. And of course this diminishes over time, but you're getting far more than just that one individual sale. So. Clearly identify the customer, and again, in an ideal world, you want to find somebody that regularly communicates with other potential customers. Now, next up is identifying who you are not trying to serve. And this might seem kind of counterintuitive because generally speaking, we have this idea that we want to reach every potential customer. Why not accept more sales? But the problem is when we design our product, to try to appeal to a mass audience, we run the risk of really appealing to nobody in particular. Because as we try to cater to the diverse needs of all kinds of different people, we almost inevitably water down the impact of our product for any one customer. So by trying to serve everybody, we ultimately don't provide a perfect product for any one customer. So don't think of this as necessarily eliminating customers, rather think of it as focusing on your ideal customer. If other people happen to buy your product, that's great, that's a bonus. But what we're trying to do here is clearly identify who we are not catering to, who we're not trying to please, who we're not going out of our way to adjust the product scope simply to appeal to another audience. Because again, as we do this, as we try to appeal to everybody, we invariably reduce our odds of appealing to any one audience 
in a way that is likely to build momentum. A, a really important thing when it comes to marketing is clearly appealing to one target audience. This allows us to build momentum with positive reviews and word of mouth referrals and repeat business in the future. Whereas typically when you try to appeal to everybody, you might generate some business here and there, but you don't really build meaningful momentum where people are giving you rave five-star reviews and are eager to recommend you to somebody else because the product was helpful, but it wasn't this perfect fit. So. We wanna know who it is that we're trying to target. We also wanna get very clear on who we're happy to have as a customer, but we're not ultimately crafting our product strategy around reaching them. So we get very clear, this is the audience we're trying to reach. That audience, if they happen to buy the product, great, but we're not going to go out of our way to appeal to them. Finally, the last part of the equation is to get very clear on what the product will not do. And this is a critical but last stage in making sure that your scope is very clearly defined. Because if you don't have a clear sense of where the outer bounds of your product are going to be, then again, it's very easy to fall into feature creep, where you just say yes to this and to that. And it might feel like this may benefit your ideal customer, but if you don't define the areas in which you will not try to meet their needs, then this is just an ever expanding world. And when it comes to your first product, you wanna be extra careful to really define exactly what it is that you're trying to build. Now, when it comes to what I'm building, this whole strategy of getting clear on scope has been massively beneficial. I think when it comes to writing a book, it feels almost more beneficial, but of course these ideas translate over to almost any product. But as I'm writing my book, getting clear on who it is that I'm trying to serve, and I would say most importantly, what it is that I'm not trying to cover has been hugely beneficial because as I outline the content of the book, there's this temptation to think that you need to create an all-encompassing guide to everything to do with raising kids. You know, I'm trying to help raise kids to be successful in an unpredictable world, but what I'm not trying to do is provide everything to do with how to raise toddlers or you know, how to instill certain principles. I'm focused on one very specific problem. And so as I've been outlining the book, I'm realizing whole areas that I'm tempted to dabble in, but I've just they're just outside of the scope of my product. So I can remove those from the outline and really stay hyper-focused on one very specific promise that I am hoping to deliver on for customers. And so as a quick example, one area in which my product was initially kind of awkwardly trying to address, and that is, uh, traditional education and how to provide advice around making sure your kids are making the most of the traditional school system, I quickly realized that's well outside of the focus of the book. And any attempt to bring that in just didn't feel authentic. It didn't feel relevant. And so that's a whole area where I'm just setting aside and I'm stating right in the beginning of the book, if this is what you're looking for, that this is not the book for you. Instead, here's what we're focusing on, here's how this is going to deliver on the promise, and here's why, if this is what you're looking for, this is indeed the right book for you. And so that's kind of the feeling you wanna have. As you're building your product, you wanna recognize that there are natural constraints as you get very clear on the scope, and as you define what it is that you are and aren't providing, there will be certain things that you might want to say yes to, but you simply recognize these are not part, these items are not part of the scope, and so you set them aside. There's a famous saying, and I'm trying to recall it here in real time, but there was a famous line from Apple, and they were saying, you know, there are plenty of things that are easy to say no to. To make a truly great product, you need to make the hard decisions. You need to say no to things you absolutely want to do, but no are not an actual fit for the product. And I'm, I'm obviously botching that, I'm trying to ad lib it here, but, that's kind of the premise. If it's something that's easy to say no to, well, you're probably not making a hard decision. If it's something you genuinely want to cover, but that you recognize is outside of the scope, that's when you know you're making the right decision and you're constraining yourself in the right way. You're staying focused on what matters and you're making those tough decisions to make sure that at the end of the day, you deliver a product that is coherent and it makes sense and it's well-defined around the promise that you are making to your customer. So that's the idea here. Now again, returning to the beginning, the two key reasons why it's so critical to nail product scope is number one, you avoid the whole issue around feature creep. You can stay hyper-focused on what it is that you're trying to build and you can bring your product to market that much faster. And then the second benefit being much 
clearer communication when it comes to your marketing. It's much easier to sell a product that has a very clear purpose, that delivers on a very clearly stated promise and meets a very real need of your customers. And so by defining your product scope, you can gain these two benefits. And I'm sure there are many other benefits, but that's kind of the idea here. Get very clear on what you're building, and it's much easier to execute moving forward. Anyway, that's it for this episode. In the very next episode, we are going to be talking about marketing. This is something that has come up in the comment section of previous episodes. So that is the topic that we are going to be tackling next. We're gonna talk about how to come up with a marketing strategy, why it's important to think about marketing from the very beginning, even before you finish your product or your service, and how to validate your marketing strategy as you go. In other words, as you start to build out your product, as you start to talk with customers, what are things that you can do to get a sense of whether or not your marketing strategy is ultimately going to succeed? So. That's what we're gonna talk about in the next episode. If you have any questions or comments about anything that we covered in this episode or previous episodes, or anything that you would like to see covered in the future, please let me know down in the comment section. And as always, I encourage you to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on future episodes. But that's it for this one. I look forward to connecting with you again in the next episode.